So without further ado, I would like to invite Claudette Commanda to come up and offer the official opening of the summit. Professor Claudette Commanda is an Algonquin Anish Anishinaabe from Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabeg First Nation, located in the province of Quebec. An alumni of the University of Ottawa Faculty of Common Law and Faculty of Arts, Claudette has dedicated the last 30 years to promoting First Nations people, history, culture, and rights in various capacities as a University of Ottawa student, professor, member, and chair of the Aboriginal Educational Council and via public speaking. She is a professor for the University of Ottawa's Institute of Women's Studies, Faculty of Education, Faculty of Law, the list of faculties goes on and on and on. She is inducted into the Common Law Honor Society, served two terms on the Board of Governors of the First Nations University of Canada, and three terms in the Kitigan Zibi Band Council. In 2017, Claudette was the first First Nation appointed elder in residence for the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, and the first person of a First Nation heritage to be appointed to the Board of Governors for the University of Ottawa. So I can't think of a better person to welcome us all to the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Please join me in giving Claudette a round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yes, you can tell I'm a professor, right? <laughs> good morning. It is a good morning. The beauty, the energy, the spirit that's in this room because of all of you beautiful people. So let us rejoice, let us give thanks for being here together for such a very important meeting, discussion. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, friends, relatives, good morning. Good morning. Right on. Good. I thank the organizers, thank you for your respect for the Algonquin people and our protocols. I truly appreciate that. Miigwech Nichikiwi, Miigwech. Land acknowledgement, which was said by the executive director, Grant, and the organizers, that's very important. Land acknowledgement of the first peoples whose territory you're on, extremely important, because it's the recognition of who we are as a people, that we have been here since time immemorial, and we continue to be here. So that protocol, that first protocol, that action was done. The next protocol, very important, was the gifting of tobacco, that sacred medicine. In requesting me to be here and say some words, so chimigwej, again, for this action. And the third protocol is welcoming each and every one of you beautiful people to this homeland. And I begin by honoring, honoring my ancestors, my first relatives, my ancestors, and I say to each and every one of you people, Welcome to each and every one of you beautiful people. On behalf of my community of Kitagon Zibi, on behalf of the Algonquin Nation, where we are located, vast territories, and on behalf of my family, my four children, my ten grandchildren, I welcome you, brothers and sisters, from the various First Nations and other Indigenous communities, and to you, Canadians, welcome to this beautiful, unsurrendered homeland of the Algonquin people. This homeland that has been entrusted onto us since time immemorial, and the homeland that we must always ensure to be here forevermore for our children today and our seven generations and beyond. And regardless of what First Nation we come from, 
or that indigenous group. We know the importance of our land, land, extremely important. And it is very pleasing to see how the consciousness of Canadians is growing. The importance of our land, the land. Without land, we are nothing. And this comes from deep, spiritual, rooted teaching and understanding that comes directly from the Creator that was gifted to us as the first people of our lands. So my brothers and sisters, I say chi for being here today. Welcome. I welcome each and every one of you with kindness, with friendship, and with love. And it pleases my heart to see that there is room here that's being provided for Indigenous knowledge. Absolutely, it's needed. Our knowledge begins at time, and we don't have a time period for that. What we, when we say time immemorial, we understand that to be from the beginning of that Creator's time. And we know we have been here forever. And we know we will continue to be here forever. And I've been asked to share some words relating to a teaching, and I thought that it would be appropriate to give a teaching, obviously, about land, right? When you use the word climate, when you use the word nature, it really is about land, 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 land. We cannot separate land from nature or from what's now the buzzword climate. We can't. Everything and anything that happens each and every day, it's connected to land. Whether it's, it is those hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, fires, loss of animals, medicines, insects, everything that changes, it's connected to land. And my grandfather, the late William Commander, he had always said, it is our knowledge that is much needed in order for people here in Canada and in, around the world, governments, to understand that it is our knowledge that is needed to continue to respect and protect the land, Mother Earth. And we truly see that today, do we not? Do we not truly see that today, how people are, are coming to First Nations people, Indigenous peoples, for our knowledge? And you're providing room for that knowledge, and that is so important. It also speaks about what was foretold, our prophecy, that there would come a time that white people would come to the red people, and how to save Mother Earth. And we have seen that revitalization movement begin after the first pro one of the prophecies that was fulfilled in 1968-69. How many of you have heard about the prophecy, the eagle landing on the moon? Well, then I will share it with you. In the 1960s, my grandfather at that time was the chief of our community. But he was also very much involved in a North American movement, a resistance movement of our tribes. And our people came together. He brought our people together, that first circle of all nations, and bringing our people together at his homestead in Kitagon Zibi. Many nations, many First Nations across North America came. Beautiful, beautiful people. Not only did we have our political leaders, we had those ceremonial leaders, we had those prophet keepers from the various nations who came to share their teachings with us. 
we shared with one another. And regardless of nation and regardless of the prophecy, there was a common message, a common message. And that there would be a resurgence of our identity and our culture, a resurgence of our wisdom, and a coming of people, people that would come to our people and ask for our knowledge to be shared. And it spoke about the importance of always protecting Mother Earth and respecting her. And we have been doing this since time immemorial through the beginning of our life as human beings. We have a responsibility to respect Mother Earth and all that she provides. So this one prophecy was shared by a Hopi elder. And I honor, I honor that man. And I thank him for sharing with us. And that prophecy spoke about a time when the eagle lands on the moon. There will be the revitalization of the Anishinaabe or the First Nation culture and identity. And it will be that time when people would come to us and ask to share our knowledge because now they would come to see the value of who we are as a people with ancestral knowledge deeply connected to spirit and culture. And that ancestral knowledge, not only did it provide for our survival of yesterday, but it provides for our survival today and tomorrow forevermore. And the prophecy was fulfilled. For we gathered one particular evening, we gathered. And we as children, we were instructed to sit and to listen. And I witnessed the eagle landing on the moon. People automatically assume, how can a bird fly so high and land on the moon? But you see how our prophecies, our teachings, are set in a different way, but they become real. And when that eagle landed on the moon, our prophet people, my grandfather, the leader, said, it is done, and so it begins. What were the first words that were, were sent down to Earth when that first spacecraft landed on the moon? The eagle has landed. Because the name of that spacecraft was called the eagle. Prophecy is real because it is our teachings. And we started, not immediately at that in the next day, but took time. And sure enough, that revitalization movement, we started to see it in the 70s. We started, we started to receive people that were turning to us, but first it began by governments, countries, different countries coming to us and inviting us to their meetings. And yet we were still not, we were still not allowed to enter into the United Nations because we were not considered people or nations. Finally in 1996, around that time period, 93 to 96, my grandfather then was invited into the United Nations to bring a message to the world, the entire world. And his teaching was called a cry for the earth because our people kept telling everyone, you must stop the destruction of Mother Earth for we will all pay the price our children will suffer. And not only must we remember human beings, but we must remember the water the animals, the insects, the medicine, all of that is 
those sacred elements are connected to land and that is important for us, for our survival as a people and not only for First Nations or Indigenous peoples, but for all people, all people. And we have been upholding our responsibility to Mother Earth and all our creations and we continue to do so. We share with you our knowledge and we're in this together. I acknowledge my ancestors as I open my words. I acknowledge the ancestors of those indigenous brothers and sisters as well. But I also acknowledge all of your ancestors as well. And I know that they are here and I feel them because I stand on that foundation of spirit. My identity and my culture and my language is who I am. And it's all connected to the land. Nindaki, Nindaki. I am the land and the land is me. And I have that responsibility to ensure that Mother Earth is respected and that she is here forever for my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren, and so on, and we all do. And I want to share with you another experience. In 1990, okay, you got to think about that time period there. Yes, I believe it was 1991. My grandfather and I, we were invited to attend the World's Conference on Indigenous Peoples and the Environment. Now, the operative word is indigenous. It was held in Paris, France. So my grandfather invited me to accompany him. I said, oh, sure, I'll go. Of course, I'm going to go. Right? So when we arrived at the conference, they separated us into countries. So we were placed in the North American delegation. But in my mind, because of the word indigenous, I automatically assumed that I was going to meet those tribes in North America. Because they told us there were 300 people from this North American delegation. Lo and behold, you know the term when it's used, it's called cultural shock? Oh, why I had cultural shock. <laughs> because when I walked in that delegation of 300 people, there were only six of us that were, no one was really using the word indigenous at the time, but there were only six of us. Four from Canada and two from the United States. So I said, well, there's a, something wrong with this picture here. Something totally wrong. And then we went into the assembly with all the countries that were there. Again, another cultural shock because the vast majority of participants were non-Indigenous peoples. But those Indigenous peoples that were there were more on the sideline, right? But when we had discussions, we had to go into our delegation group. So there was one particular workshop that was called How to Save the Earth. How to save the earth, how to save Mother Earth. So my grandfather and I and the two other First Nation women from uh, the Lakota territories in the United States, we attended this workshop because they wanted us there. They wanted us there. And they kept referring to us as the red people. The red people. Well, I said, my grandfather, well, he was very radical. So it's a whole lot better than what they usually call us. <laughs> but I won't say what it was, what they called us, okay? So here are 290 plus people are talking about how to save Mother Earth. We don't know how to save Mother Earth. And they're becoming frustrated. They're becoming, um, you know, anxious. They don't have an answer. We're sitting on the guidelines, you know, sidelines here. No one's asking us, and no one's letting us have the microphone. How do we save Mother Earth? Then they, all eyes turn to us. We, we need to know from the red people. All right, we're going to share, but no, no, no. They said, well, we'll, we'll, we're not finished our discussions. 
We, we, we still have we, have, we have to find a solution and how to save Mother Earth, and then we'll ask you your opinion. All right. By this time, like, we're just getting fed up, you know. So my grandfather said, let's go. I said, okay. Now, people are, how do we save Mother Earth? We just don't know. We really want to save her. But, and they're becoming really frustrated because they need to go back and report this, right? So we got up, we walked out, and I said, I have something to say. So immediately, everyone's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The red people are going to talk. They're finally going to give, oh, my God. We're going to see the light, you know. Like, when I think about it, that's exactly how it took place. And you got to find a humor in it, right? So I said to them, for two and a half hours, you've been debating. You've been having this discussion. You've been coming frustrated. How to save Mother Earth. But you haven't come up, you have not come up with an answer yet. And I could feel your anxiety. I said, but the answer is simple. It's so simple. So immediately, you know, the notepads, uh, the pen and paper comes out, oh, you know, with the microphone, like, oh, we're going to have a, the red people are going to tell us. They probably thought we were going to give like an hour discussion on this, right? I said, it's simple, plain and simple. How to save Mother Earth? Give it back to the red people. Then we walked out. <laughs> they didn't know how to take us at that moment. But the point was, the point why I'm, I am sharing this with you is just to show that we, we have that knowledge, that an ancestral knowledge in how to live with Mother Earth. And when our people say we live on the land, no. When people say we live on the land, no, no. We're reminded that we have to use the right way of saying it. How we live with the land. With. She provides for us. And I'm going to leave you with, with this teaching. I don't know if, how many of you in this room have ever seen a medicine wheel. But if you have, and if you have not, the medicine wheel is an instrument that we use for our teachings. It speaks about Mother Earth and all of our cre and, and creation. But it represents Mother Earth, Grandfather, Son, Grandmother, the Moon. It represents our life. It represents those four passages of our life. It represents the four seasons, four medicines. It speaks about who we are, from that spiritual and cultural way of life. In our creation, it is said that there are two things that we share in commonality. So to you, my brothers and sisters in this room, you can look to your left, to your right, in the front, in the back. And what are those two commonalities that you can relate to? What are they? What are they? It does not matter what color we are, it does not matter the race we come from, and it certainly does not matter the title we hold. It doesn't. The two things we share in commonality, there is only one Mother Earth for all. Only one. Creator did not give a Mother Earth for the red people, or the white people, or the black people, or the yellow people, or the brown people, and whatever. He gifted all of us people with one Mother Earth, and we all have a responsibility to her. And the second, we are all related. We are all related in that human family, all related. And let us show our relationship through love and kindness. Let us show that relationship through respect of who we are to one another. And let us show that relationship and how we move forward, and how we move forward to find those best ways to ensure that the land, the nature, and the climate is protected, is respected, and that will be here today and forevermore, not only for my grandchildren, but for your grandchildren and your descendants. Just think about that. 
Miigwech nitchkiwe dog kibijan oman ongom. Miigwech for listening to me. I truly appreciate having this time to share who I am and that knowledge that I carry. Miigwech. Thank you very much.